be with you all in spirit today, those who are part of our church here, those who might be watching elsewhere. Uh, so good to be together. Uh, look forward to the time when we can join together again in person, but until then, we know that the church spans space and time, and this distance will not keep us apart. We're thankful for the means of modern technology to bring this to you, and we just praise the Lord for sustaining us and keeping us through difficult times. I would greet you this morning with that ancient greeting that Christians began to use early on to identify themselves when they saw one another and to praise Jesus by saying, He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. On week three of our quarantine, uh, more for some of us, uh, it is good to know that nothing has changed in terms of the Lord Jesus. He is still risen. Uh, as a matter of fact, that, that term, that, that verb, is, indicates that he is still actively in the business of making his resurrection effective to those who come to him. Is doesn't mean past. It means present and future as well. So we celebrate today that the Lord is working He's working now, even in the midst of this worldwide pandemic. Uh, he will be working all the way until that great day when he comes again and all things will change. It is good to be with you. Uh, please, uh, again, just I want to express my appreciation for Ben Palachek and the Ward family for helping with the production, the music, uh, putting these services together. It's truly a blessing to have the talent and the, um, just the desire to help during this time. No. Today, as we worship you, encourage us in these truths, 
Inspire us to live for Jesus. Give us all hope in Him. In His precious name we pray. Amen.
Let's again join our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that it represents and the reality that it is. The reality that there is life, life in spite of death, life even for sinners such as we. Lord, we ask that you would help us to see each and every day the glory of the resurrection. And Lord, that we would live in it. Lord, we ask in these difficult days that you would lend us the perspective that all is well. And Lord, that you have not abandoned nor forsaken us, that indeed you are here and you are working in mighty ways. Lord, we praise you. We praise you for the way in which you have sustained us in these times of confusion and isolation. Lord, that you have been our company and our well-being. Lord, we thank you that the salvation that you offer through Jesus is ours when we accept him forever and ever, not through our acceptance, not through our great faith. Uh, indeed, it is a little faith on many days, but it is because of his great salvation made perfect and complete through his power and holiness that we rejoice. And Lord, we rejoice as well that the Lord has not closed the book. Uh, he has not ended the names of those who will join you in heaven. But he is adding day by day to the number. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to have a vision for salvation for those in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our families who do not know him. Help us not to give up on them. Help us to believe in the power of Christ to transform lives and hearts. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would equip us to do so, that you would help us to be your salt and light in this world and to live for you. Lord, we come before the throne today asking for your provision in some specific ways. We do ask that you would comfort those who grieve the loss of loved ones in these past few weeks to this virus, perhaps those who were healthy just a month ago but now are gone. We ask for your mercy there and healing. Lord, we ask that you would continue to provision and lift up those who are risking their very help to provide services to us, of course, for our health care workers, for uh, Jesse Stilwell and Tiffany Riccardi, for Malcolm Marion. I want to add uh, Betsy Wallace, Gail Crocker's uh, daughter to that number. Uh, others who are on the front lines who are giving of their time and energy and risking their very health to care for others. I also want to remember those who are also on the front line in different ways for those who are providing groceries and items that we need for us. Uh, for those working with the utility companies and transportation and other work sectors that we need. For first responders who are still there, who are attending to the crises in our community. Lord, we, we lift them up as well. Lord, we also remember those who are dealing with this disease, who are less fortunate than our country, less able to deal with massive uh, a massive health crisis for countries who who don't have the resources we we lift them up to you and we ask that there would be a lessening of of this virus there we also continue to just pray for a cure lord we ask that you would take this away through either the ordinary means of vaccine or just a dissipation a disappearance of the COVID-19 virus. Lord, we pray that you would protect our economy and the world's economies. We ask that 
you would help us to bounce back quickly, that you would protect those individuals, uh, many who have lost their jobs in these last few weeks and who are already struggling financially. We ask even more than any of these things that this hard day would lead to a revival, a great harvest of souls. We have prayed for this as your church for many years. Perhaps in your mercy that this would be the time that it would occur. Lord, we ask that you would show people that their stability, their future does not lie in health or a stable economy, but in Christ and Christ alone. And we ask that you would show it to millions upon millions. Lord, we dare to pray these things in his precious name. He who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our memory verse for the month is from Psalm 138, 8. Let's say that together now. The Lord, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Psalm 138, 8.
The number one cause of death, heart disease. We lose over 647,000 of our citizens each year nationwide. That's 1,772 per day. Number two, cancer, 599,000. That's 1,641 citizens a day to cancer. Number three, accidents. 170,000 a year, 466 a day. Number four, respiratory disease, 160,438 a day. And number five, stroke, 146,000 victims each year here in the U.S. to stroke, that's 400 per day. So if COVID-19 takes the lives of 60,000 Americans, that's approximately three times the number it has taken so far. That will only make it the eighth leading cause of death in the U.S. this year. Death is all around us. And just to remind those of you who might be prone to see the end times and bad times, these are actually the best of times when it comes to mortality rates. Americans can now expect to live to be an average of 78 years old, that is nearly 30 years older uh, than in the early 20th century, just a little over 100 years ago, and twice as old as our ancestors who first settled this area in South Carolina, this colony in the 18th century. Twice as old, late 30s was about all you could expect then. A hundred years ago, when we were in, the, in that great Spanish influenza pandemic, that killed an estimated 600,000 Americans and 50 to 100 million worldwide. So you see, death is nothing new, and yet as we watch the news, as we perhaps even talk to people, it seems that indeed many people are considering death as a reality for the first time, and they need to. It's important. So as we wind up our Victorious Christian Living series today on Easter, we're going to contemplate just how it is that people can be victorious even over this last and greatest enemy, death, and what part Jesus plays in that. First of all, where did death come from? Well, you know this story. You know it well. A man woman, a perfect situation, and I mean perfect, no pain, no suffering, no struggle, and zero death. But then sin was introduced to that scenario, and all those hardships were activated. Why? As punishment. As punishment for their disobedience. And that was completely fair, because God had clearly warned them ahead of time that this would be the result. He said in Genesis 2, verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And God could not backtrack on that edict, or it would make him something less than a God's, something less than one of complete truthfulness and sovereign power. So Adam and Eve disobeyed of their own volition, of their own freedom, and judgment rained down on them in all shapes and forms, culminating in the greatest judgment of all death. One could say quite accurately then that death is man's fault. So what did God do about death, if anything? Well, sin did not take God by surprise. He knew that it would occur even before it actually happened. And he had a plan to combat it before, as the scripture tells us, the age even began, before time began. Why? Because as simplistic as this may sound, my friends, God loves man. He loves people. There's that wonderful Hebrew term from the Old Testament. Chesed. And that means God's steadfast love. That love that cannot be 
removed. God loves people and he chose not to let us simply fall on the sword of our own making. He chose as well not to wipe us out and start over. So even as he enacted the judgment that he said he would upon fallen people, God went about lessening that great hammer blow of his punishment for our sin. How did he do that? In Genesis 3.15, we see, we see the first inkling when God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, singular. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the promise there, you see, of this lethal, crushing headshot to Satan who instigated the sin. That, that lethal blow was inflicted on our great enemy and indeed on sin itself by the offspring or the seed of the woman, a child, a human being, a seed promised and given by God as a champion for us, for fallen people. Now as time went on, the prophecy was added to in multiple ways and at multiple times through God's word to his messengers. The champion, as it, as it was added to, would be of the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David. He would be born of a virgin. He would be a plain and ordinary man, yet also fully God. He would be born in Bethlehem, hunted, escaped to Egypt, all foretold. He'd be preceded by a voice in the wilderness, a new Elijah, that is John the Baptist, preparing the way. He would heal, he would perform miracles and cast out demons and even raise the dead back to life. He would ride a donkey into Jerusalem as its king. He would be hated, deceived, rejected, and unfairly sentenced by men. All of this prophesied hundreds of years before it actually happened. He'd be beaten, spat upon, crucified, and his clothes made the object of wagering. And then he would taste death. All this was planned out of God the Father's great love for people. All carried out, you see, by Jesus Christ, he who was foreseen and divinely planned to the very nth degree in so many hundreds of ways so that it was remarked upon by that wise counselor, Francis Schaeffer, who once said, the possibility of any one man having done all these things, let alone being all that was designated, was impossible as a matter of coincidence. Jesus fulfilled them all because he is what the Bible says he would be. Yet, I want to clarify what it is that, that is the object of Christian celebration today on Easter. It's not all the pain and suffering so much that Jesus bore on our behalf. It's not the cross. The cross is a reminder of the price that Jesus paid out of that love for us. It's a reminder of the Savior bearing the sins of man as a sacrifice, even though he himself was innocent. The cross is a reminder of death. The cross is also a reminder of our shame. But Easter, you see, is about life, not death. It's about a stone rolled back, an empty tomb, sorrow turned to joy, a walk to Emmaus, an appearance in the upper room, forgiving, saving, empowering. It's about a man who was also God, who burst the constraints of mortality and was reborn, achieving victory, not shame. Well, who is eternal life for? Who is resurrection for? Easter is especially for reminding you 
or telling you very clearly, perhaps for the first time, that it's about Jesus gaining perfect life over death and offering it to you. How do you receive it? Simply this, as it says in John 3.36, 336, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Jesus' resurrection from death to eternal life wasn't simply for Him. It was and is the same type that He offers to us. Jesus makes this offer only He could have earned it through His sinless obedience and sacrifice. Only He can give it through His divine power. There's nothing you can do to gain or earn that life. You can't be a good or nice person and earn it. If that's the case, who gets to define what good or nice is? I can tell you how that works. It's, it's as if the judges were back and that phrase that defines that whole book is true. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I remind you of something that I have shared here before that uh, uh, something that an old friend from Liberia in Africa once told us when Allison was pregnant with our twin boys our friend revealed that in her culture twins were often killed when they were born and sometimes the mother as well because it was a, a bad omen for the family and for the so in their definition, it was good to kill babies. That's the definition of good for many people here in our country and other places in the name of women's choice. Even if we do true good, that is good according to Scripture, as Isaiah reminds us in chapter 64, every righteous deed that we do, every good, truly good deed that we do, is still like a filthy rag because it still contains sin. And if you think about it, uh, consider even in good things the pride, the greed, the anger, the laziness that also is a part of it, and you get a picture there. Every part of us is tainted by sin, and that serves ultimately to separate us from God. We cannot earn our salvation by doing good things. We can only gain it as it has been offered to us through the one true Savior who did earn it for us. His righteousness then transfers to us. John 3.36 goes on to warn those who don't believe in Christ that they shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on them. There is no good answer for us apart from Jesus, only endless death and punishment. Jesus offers you life, abundant, eternal, free from sin, victory over death. You're hesitant, yes, to Jesus' offer means that eternal life is yours made effective through Him. Yours. Yours, now and forever. Well, what are some of the implications of eternal life? What does it mean and not mean to have everlasting life in Christ? It does not necessarily mean health and wealth and security here in these mortal days on earth. Try telling that to a Christian in a refugee camp in Syria or suffering in the locust plagues in Africa, or to a believer who has endured abuse. And you're liable to get an earful. Don't try telling them that uh, eternal life means that you're going to be healthy and wealthy and safe. That's not true. Not here. That's where true victorious Christianity diverges from the false kind pumped by many of the big TV personalities. It does not mean living to be 100 years old, ripe old age, or having a, a statue in honor of something that you did or your name in a history book or any other such worldly goal. It 
does mean, however, looking forward to something you've never experienced even for a moment in this life. A misplaced saying goes something like this. It's all about the journey, not the destination. Now that may apply to a road trip, but it does not apply at all to life as opposed to the destination which awaits the believer. That destination will make us forget all about this journey. But eternal life definitely has implications for the way that we live now. It does. For one, it should lessen your concern if you have some. Certainly your anxiety or even your panic about COVID-19. Or for that matter, heart issues, hurricanes, cancer, car wrecks, aging, Alzheimer's, poverty, persecution, terrorist trials of all kinds. You get the picture. It should alleviate in great part our anxiety, certainly our fear. But it should also give us pause to think about death a little clearly and perhaps often. Billy Graham in his book, Peace with God, wrote this observation. It is strange that people will prepare for everything except death. We prepare for education. We prepare for business. We prepare for our careers. We prepare for marriage. We prepare for old age. We prepare for everything except the moment we are to die. Now, what does that mean? Well, I do not think it's referring to will and estate planning, though I do highly recommend that you do that unless you just want to create paperwork and confusion for your heirs as well as forfeiting a large chunk of your estate to the state of South Carolina or whatever uh, state that you live in through probate costs. I would encourage you very much to go through the process of will and estate planning, but that's not the point of Dr. Graham's remarks. It means prepare for dying to live the right way, to live in the glory and the light of Jesus, not living as if this existence were the goal. This day is all that matters these few decades, but instead finding our true joy in a relationship here and now with the Savior. We do that through prayer and through study of His Word and through regular worship, not sporadic, but regular, needing it very much. We do that as well through making Him known to others, to, to know and understand how lost we were and yet how found we are in Jesus in, in this life that He gives us means that we have a heart for other people because we want them to have that abundant life too. And it means supporting the work and worship of His body, which is the church in the world. And in taking a long view on things, the long view, and keeping our eyes fixed ahead on His great promises that lie just beyond. I love how J.R. Tolkien puts it in the third part of his Lord of the Rings work. As Gandalf the wizard speaks encouragement to a frightened little hobbit as a great battle rages around them and death seems quite imminent, unavoidable. Is this the end? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path one that we all must take. The gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass and then you see it. White shores and beyond. A far green country under a swift sunrise. Or as the risen and glorified Savior states it very plainly to the Apostle John, in Revelation 21, what waits ahead for the believer in Christ is that time and place where God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the 
former things have passed away. That's what Easter means. Life in spite of death. Our best life waiting just ahead forever and ever because Christ's victory is ours. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that through your resurrection you offer it to us that we can look beyond the dark days, even the best days, to the better ones to come, to that time and place where there will be no sin or effects of sin. There will be no hurt and sorrow. There will be no anger and frustration. There will be no fear and loneliness, but only joy and complete glory in your very presence forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>